Hi, if you or your children are suffering because of your relationship with your ex-partner, because it's stressed or strained, or maybe they're just not a nice person, this show is for you. Welcome to the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast with Brooke Olson and Charlie Jewett. Enjoy another episode now. Hey folks, welcome back to the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast with Brooke Olson and Charlie Jewett. We have one expert and one who knows what my job is, Brooke. Just, uh, I'm just interested. I'm just interested. Um, although this particular podcast, this episode, I don't know what I could possibly add, Brooke, because you know in my divorce, I'm totally innocent. I've never done anything wrong and there's no reason to take responsibility, right? <laughs> Wait, you don't believe me? Well, I'm skeptical. Right. This well, is on 100% responsibility, right? Owning, owning it. Owning all of it. Owning all everything. Of it. All owning of it? Absolute everything. Come on, buddy. When I was going through my last divorce, my uh, my good buddy um, had this line that he would feed to me, and we'd get into some discussions uh, around um, some stuff that may be going on in his life. And he would jokingly, when I would start um, being adversarial with him, he would say, oh, it's all my fault. <laughs> all my fault. Uh, that's all my fault and the interesting piece about it was is he wasn't being funny um he was being directive and the place that he was pointing was a place that i i already knew about that i've talked about a lot but it really helped me come into another level of um relationship with the idea that it is all my fault everything that has occurred to that moment and what's going to occur going forward is my fault. I caused it. I created it. It's my responsibility to solve it. And this is, this is a position that I'm really strong about. Um, There's a victim place that we can play in. And uh, Richard Bach, um, one of my favorite authors, he's um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Um, My favorite book that he wrote was um, Illusions. And the quote that I I pull from my book, that uh, Richard made was this. If it's never our fault, we can't take responsibility for it. If we can't take responsibility for it, we'll always be its victim. So we can solve a problem. We can take care of it. We can be responsible for it, or we can blame somebody else. And if we're in blame, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. So let's make this a no victim zone. Let's move forward. Let's take responsibility and Let's make the shift. And we talked a little bit about this in, the, in, our, in our second podcast. And um, this, is, this is the podcast that we're really going to expand on. Yeah. And any story that starts in my last divorce has is, is got to be a good story, right? So definitely <laughs> worth, worth listening to. Maybe we should interview Elizabeth Taylor. Is she still alive? I don't know what's going on with her. No. Um, I, this is going to be a good show for me, probably because I'll be learning more than teaching, which is the awesome part of doing the show with you. Um, I remember people telling me, and people, these people were coming from a particularly aggressive uh, religious um, worldview, stop acting like a victim. Stop acting like a victim. Stop thinking like a victim. And the entire time, I was shutting down. I wasn't listening to anything they were saying because I'm like, but I am. <laughs> like, things were done. Right? I, I, res- I was on the receiving end of things that should not happen, particularly in that religious worldview. However... Uh, someone else said, if you walk out your front door and are shot by a sniper, that shooting is their fault. You are a victim. However, the going to the hospital, the recovery, uh, the dealing with the fear of walking out the front door, the, the rest of your life dealing with the fact that someone shot you is now your responsibility. And there's a difference that you can say bad. you're not saying you're not allowed to say negative things happened in your life. You're just saying, own it, move on, be a great mom, be a great dad, something in that realm, right? Well, not really, Charlie. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of veer in here because when we're talking about um, something happening in a negative or positive fashion, um, that's a dualistic approach. That is um, good and bad, this or that. And, When we start to enter into this conversation, life is a continuum. There's going to be things that are difficult. There's going to be things that are easy. We're going to ride waves 
of, of accomplishment and we're going to ride waves of um, loss. And when we look at them dualistically, like you were just talking, um, we're saying that that was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be learned. As a matter of fact, as human beings, most everything that we learn is when we're in a place of difficulty, when we're in a place of stress, when we are having to solve problems and figure out how to heal. I got shot. What was that about? Well, there's a place here maybe where I needed to um, take some time down and to be able to um, learn how to take better care of myself, to change my habits. And this is just simply the universe's way of getting me there. So I want to take the conversation for the sake of this podcast and really blow the idea that um, something bad happens out of the water. And you said this to me, I mean, on a conversation that had nothing to do with the podcast, just part of our relationship, you said, look at what has come from your divorce, right? right. Including this podcast, the, the meeting of you, right? You came into my life through my divorce as a meeting. Right. Right. And tell me, tell the story because the, we're, the, the life is happening for you, not to you model is really affected me. You, you, in one of your classes, people can attend by Skype. You don't have to be in California. I happen to be here. So I saw you in person, but uh, anybody can take this class. In one of the classes, you told a story. I don't know if it was a movie or something about a guru and everything that happened in a guy's life. People were like, oh my God, he got drafted or whatever. And like, that's so bad. And then the guru I was like, is it? We'll have to wait and see. Do you remember the story? Right. And, and, and it's a, the story that um, I heard first um, from the movie um, Charlie Wilson's War. And the okay. CIA agent is talking about um, the war in Afghanistan with the Afghanistanis and the Russians and how the U.S. went in and started to support um, the Afghanis. And today that's evolved into a place where they're using some of those same weapons against us. So, you know, when we start something in, in motion, we don't know what's going to occur. We just get to watch it unfold. And the story that you're referring to was um, the story of the Zen master in the village where, you know, paraphrase briefly, the, um, there was this young boy born into um, some affluence in this village and his parents gave him a horse when he was a very young boy. And the villagers were all around in astoundment about this this boy and his horse and how fortunate he was and the zen master said we will see and yeah. years went by and the boy was out riding his horse and um the horse threw him and he broke his leg and crippled him and villagers were all around seeing this crippled boy and going how unfortunate that this this young boy is crippled and he won't be able to walk right again. And the Zen master said, we will see. And years went by and the villagers got in, into a war with a neighboring village and many of the young men went into war and they died. And this young man now was left behind and the villagers were looking at this situation going, wow, this little boy was now a young man and he's crippled and he couldn't go to war. And because of that, he's still here in the village alive. How fortunate. And the Zen master said, we will see. Hmm. Life is a continuum. We don't know good from bad, fortune from misfortune. And as we look back on our lives, we can see how this is true, how each event moves to another event and what seems to be really great, I remember um, being married on the cliffs of Mexico in this wonderful place at this party of my friends around and this big open heart um, event that fell into disarray and divorce. And we will that see. <laughs> disarray and divorce moved into another beautiful relationship and we will see, we will see how this unfolds. And this is, this is the place of being out of duality 
of that idea of getting shot being an unfortunate piece. Because even if we're not here, even if that event ends in our death, something happens for the people that are left behind that impacts them, that helps them either move forward or get stuck in their lives. So right. the continuum doesn't stop here. Right? Yeah. And I'm, this is the, this is the episode I'm least prepared for. And I don't mean I didn't prepare. I mean, it's probably the content I know the least about or haven't mastered, but this world of, good and bad and that i think you're calling that duality right yes that world that i lived in with 22 years of sort of hardcore um christianity really religiousness right that one 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 world view um it doesn't it's that doesn't serve us that well we'd be better with a neutrality either reality just is or with a good only which is, yeah, someone just sliced open my body, but it was to remove a cancerous tumor, right? It's just the, the bad quote, the things that we look at in a moment of time, if you stopped right there and didn't see what was next, you could say, I wish that hadn't happened. Right? But, it, but it's, never, it's never by itself. The, the cutting in surgery comes before the removal of the cancer, right? There's a reason. And trusting that, and again, people don't have to believe in God as a person, God as an entity, whatever, but whatever it is that you, this entire thing that is happening around us and our hearts beating and when someone dies, the body's still there, but something's left, all that mystery, the working of the human eyeball, whatever you want to call that, universe, God, it doesn't matter the name. The name doesn't matter because the thing exists, it just is, <laughs> right? And that you'd be better off trusting it than not. You'd be better off saying it's some, it, these things are happening for me, not to me, right? Yes. And to really come to it from a place of wonderment rather than resistance. Can people have awe instead of anger? They can have both. Why does it have to be one or the other? They can Back be to my dualistic nature. Thank you. Right. They can, be, <laughs> they can be in anger and they can be in awe. You know, it, it, they, they can exist simultaneously. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And if we can remove out of this idea of duality, good or bad, this or that, black or white, you or me, and explore what is happening from that personal, interpersonal perspective, then we're evolving. Now we're starting to see more of what is available to us for our personal growth and for the growth of our children. Give me the evolution quote again. I love it. Hmm. We're in charge of our own evolution. Totally different message, right? Right. I mean, that's a completely different, I'm 46 and heard that a week ago from you, right? Right. We're in charge of our own evolution. And that's not just a we I am and you are in charge of Charlie and Brooks. That's a we human are in charge of our own human evolution, right? Micro and macro. Both. And somehow, I don't understand it, but somehow the small decisions I make as a micro do something to the macro, don't they? Absolutely. We're all connected in this. So how much power do we have? How much, uh, a single mom... She ended a relationship with a, a man she didn't love anymore or treated her poorly and is still a booger. And she's got these beautiful children and is going to apply what we taught last week and the week before. She's going to disengage from this angry ex and she's going to parallel parent no matter what the kids or the other person says. She's going to do her best. Struggling. You know she's struggling. Working. Because now there's two households, two rents, two mortgages, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. She's not got a sugar daddy. She's, she's on her own, right? And she makes a change, even if it's just internal. She just thinks differently because of something she's heard. What can that do to the world? It changes it. It changes the consciousness as we grow it. And as we show it in the world, the world can pick it up and expand it. There's a quote. This is, a, this is another quote. I really wasn't here to, um, to bring this one in. 
and I'm hoping it's right here. Ah, here it is. Um, there's two quotes from a from one of my teachers, okay. and it goes and it goes directly to what you were talking about here as, as this stuff moves into the world through us as parents. Mm -hmm. um, these are two quotes. Um, both are from um, an Indian guru called Sai Baba. The first one is this. If there's righteousness in the heart, there's beauty in the character. If there's beauty in the character, there's harmony in the home. When there's harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. When there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. So if I, if I go back to the beginning, righteousness in the heart, our listeners, that's the peace they can control. True? Right. This is, this is their integrity. This is their, I am going to do this the best that I can. I am going to learn as much as I can learn here. I am going to be open as a parent. I'm going to teach these principles to my child from whatever spiritual or, or, or religious perspective that you're coming from. And I'm going to cast that forward. And in, in the world of humility, it doesn't matter what religious perspective or world view you have. If you teach your kids in humility, here are my beliefs based on the intake and the data that I've received. But what I want for you is not to be the same as me, but to go and pursue truth and come to your own beliefs, right? Explore it. Absolutely. I mean, harmony, uh, unity, which we used to talk about in the one religion I was a part of, unity really isn't everyone believing the same thing. Unity would be everyone um, understanding ev that everyone else is just doing their best and with the data and the experiences you have, honoring the truth and teaching the truth as much as possible, right? doesn't have to be sameness. That's not unity. That's uniformity, right? No, uni unity is our connectedness. Unity is, as we all have a common experience. And if I can, like you began to start the conversation, if I can um, have an effect um, and I can effectively change my perspective, that's going to move outward and help change the perspective of somebody else. And that common experience, this is, we're, I know we're off topic, but I'm passionate about this. That common experience can't be beliefs because no one has lived the same life as another person. And that's where beliefs come from, right? Experience and what you've seen and what you've felt. The unity, the common experience has to be all of us are here. We know that life exists, that humans are here but we weren't there in the beginning and we're not there at the end if we're still here, right? Right. You can't decide how the world came to be or what happens after and make everybody else try to believe the same thing and say, I'm not going to be united with you. I'm not going to be at peace and in harmony with you unless you believe exactly the same as I am. Can't you, wouldn't the unity and the peace and the love just be, I'm another human being doing my best and I respect right. you wherever you are. I know that you're doing the best that you can. Couldn't we heal the entire world by getting rid of the belief that they could have done better, but they're just a jerk? Right, right. So what you're talking about, Charlie, is challenging beliefs to coming into relationship with other people's beliefs and to not be in resistance to, but acceptance of, so I can understand better. I don't have to go down that road. I don't have to do it that way, but I need to understand what your perspective is and to honor that piece and to perhaps grow from that perspective. Yeah, you there's, don't, you don't honor a, your psycho ex by saying, I would have not done that because you lived a life that they didn't, right? Right. You would honor them by saying, honestly, if I'd lived their life, I, I would do that. And how do I know that's true? Because they did. You, you need to throw away that they could have done better and chose not to because they're a jerk. And what, how do we know we need to throw that away? Because cats meow, they don't bark, right? 
You don't say, I, I, you can spend your entire life trying to get a cat to bark and it's going to meow. So reality tells you what they did. And that means they should. And secondly, you didn't live that, right? And thirdly, how does it feel to believe they should have done different but chose not to? It, it doesn't feel positive. So there's reasons to let the belief go, right? Yeah, this is what Arlo Guthrie had to say about the, the, this exact conversation that we're having here. And, and, and to push this piece forward. I mean, these are people that have pondered these conversations and, and come up with some, some nuggets that I just think are so powerful. Arlo Guthrie said this about this subject. He said, everyone has a responsibility to not only tolerate another person's point of view, but also to accept it eagerly as a challenge to your own understanding and to express those challenges in terms of serving other people. Hmm. So to your point of that's a perspective and I don't need to be in resistance to that perspective. I need to bring that perspective in. I need to, to play with that and understand that and see where that came from. And then to take that understanding and to move it outward in a way that the expression helps other people, which is exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. This is exactly what you're doing with your perspective with your ex, what I'm doing with the perspectives of my ex, to bring those in and to say, hey, I understand this. I know how you got here. And I don't want to dishonor your experience. I just don't want to go there with you. Mm -hmm. Right? I was in that's, tears. I was that's in tears your job to do that. You remember me being in tears in one of your classes? I do. I was in tears. And it had to do with, I, mean, I don't know, like eight, nine, ten people in the room, three, four more on Skype, right? On uh, uh, your, mm -hmm. your Ring Central and Zoom, piping them in through uh, video. But you asked us to own our own, the piece of it that was ours. And if I'm, Remembering accurately, my pe I was saying my piece was, this is somebody who already had been hurting, already had been hurt. They were already damaged, already like had pain in their life, right? And rather than realize this is not going to work, let me let me bring a peaceful end to this. I stayed and screamed and yelled and fought and pushed back and right. created more pain. Like basically. Right. I, 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 uh, my responsibility was I, I hurt a hurt person instead of, instead of saying, um, let me release you to go heal and find someone that's, you know, better match for you. This hundred percent, I know I took us off course, uh, with some of my passions and just what I'm feeling. And that's, that's probably what makes the podcast awesome. Right. They were just being real. What, what for a hundred percent responsibility, I've heard you talk about never ask for anything. What in the world does that have to do with 100% responsibility? Well, you said it earlier. I don't remember whether it was early in this podcast or in our last one. You said that you act as though the other person is no longer on the planet, that you are responsible for every need that these, ch that these children... How would you parent if they're dead, right? Exactly. Well, how would you parent when, if they were there? How would you provide for them if they weren't there. If you're dependent on that other person for income or for, for insurance or for whatever that is, and you are in an argument with that person for them taking care of their responsibility to provide for their children, and they're not doing it, and you're fighting for that. When you're fighting for that, you're taking away your own energy for your own parenting and creating your own world. And if you didn't do that, if you had the capacity, and every one of us does have the capacity, it just isn't easy to step in and say, you know what? No. I can do this. I can get their clothes. I can provide their food. I can get them to and from school. I can give these children everything they need without the other person's participation. And if I can do that, if that's, if that's my perspective, everything from there is a bonus. 
if they're engaging, if they're adding to, if they're bringing in, um, then that's a bonus. And the possibility of that happening is, is exponentially um, grown from that not asking for, because you're not adding in that resentment or those other things that we're coming from. This is simply, I'm going to do this. And if they're going to step up and be the parent that they um, can or want to be, then they are going to naturally do that. And if they don't, you're just moving down the line. You're just taking care of business. You're just providing. And that asking for something from the other parent that they are not willing to freely give is a hook for the conflict. It is a place for um, resentment and disagreement and um, a, a flashing of this idea that they are not in a healthy place to take care of the beings that they help bring into the world. And if they are that narcissistic, if they are that far off on that end, anything that you go to ask them for becomes problematic. And everything's right? a privilege. Everything's a privilege. If you're receiving support, child or alimony, right? Right. That's a privilege. And if that person had died or wasn't there or you were a single, I mean, it's been proven, I would probably millions of times, maybe hundred, at least hundreds of thousands of times, it's been proven that a single parent can do this, right? Right. Anything you receive is a privilege. It's not a right, right? Anything that you pay, let's go to my situation, right? <laughs> Paying is a privilege. I wanted the children, right? I'm happy to provide for the children. I'd like more time with them. But paying for them to have clothing and schooling and doctors, that's also a privilege, right? Right. That's you honoring your responsibility to your children. And, and reality, if you had a broken attorney, a broken judge, and everything seemed to go wrong, isn't that just the slice before the removal of the cancerous tumor? Isn't that just the piece that we're looking at in a snapshot of time and saying, dualistically, that's bad? When the reality is, no, that's of all the judges and attorneys you could have had, those are the ones that were chosen in reality, call reality God. That's what God chose. And you don't get it. I, I understand that. I understand you don't understand it. But somehow... It's for you, and it's the only way something needed or good could have happened. You are where you're supposed to be, and that's what got you there, which makes it good. Well, we're back into duality with good and bad. It's just where you are and how do you navigate it. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to stop, are you? No, I'm not. You know, because the, the idea that this concept of good and bad um, events is, is really a trap. And, um, and one of the things that I, I try to keep my, my face into is, is what am I learning here? Mm. What is it that is being enhanced in my evolution from this piece that just sucks? <laughs> and by sucks, I mean, it's uncomfortable. And that leads me to this next, this next piece. And that that's I an really okay word. Right? Uncomfortable is an okay word versus right. bad, which right. may have been abused or not used properly. But we can say uncomfortable, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if, if we take and we, and we fulcrum off of that into this idea that conflict is an internal construct, it isn't caused by something outside of us it is caused by something inside of us then this enhances this idea of 100 percent responsibility somebody does something and it causes a reaction in me that is uncomfortable then i want to shake off that discomfort i want to do something to make that go away and that leads me to an engagement that leads me into a um a counter to that that's an external expression and that creates the conflict cycle because what i get back from that is 
another ping, another set of circumstances that makes me uncomfortable again, and we've started a positive feedback loop, that has a negative outcome. So somebody punches you in the face, and you fall on the ground and lay there. Do we have a conflict yet? No, it takes two people. It takes two people to be in conflict. What I'm hearing is you'd have to make a decision based on the the discomfort or the uncomfort of pain in your face or being embarrassed or whatever, right? Right. Wouldn't you have to stand up and go, I'm going to make a decision to push them or punch them or whatever? Wouldn't you have to do something? Well, there's an internal conversation. And the conversation is, is, um, you know, to move more into the cognitive process of, what is the outcome of my next movement here? If I get up and I knock this person down, now we're in conflict. Now we're back and forth and there's no resolution, right? We're going we're gonna to fight this until somebody doesn't get up. Right. Or I can stand there and go, you know, that stung. And my survival is not at risk here. So I'm just going to step back and see if they step back. Now, if my survival is at risk in this dance, then there might be some action that needs to be taken. And you're talking about self-defense. But self-defense is really an interesting concept as you move into this, because there's things that need to be defended, and there's things that don't. And just because I got hit with something that's uncomfortable doesn't mean that I need to engage and defend it. Well, it what I want to say is self-defense is always physical. It, whatever your ex is texting or emailing or submitting to court, right? Right. None of that is life-threatening. No. You understand where I'm going? Yep. Like none of it needs to be defended. This is if someone bursts in your door and it has a knife to you like okay now you can hit him with a hammer right Right. like you don't have to enter a conflict through electronic means ever however the defensive mechanism that is in our nervous system is the same yeah the fight flight piece is going to come on whether it is a text or it's a knife. Because we didn't have text when we started, whether you want to call it creation or not. The fight-flight mechanism used to be always physical. A bear is about to bite me, run, right? right? right. And we have that, except now the world has internet, lodge documents, court proceedings, phone calls, and texts, right? Right. So we have to have discernment and be able to really, you know, we talked in our first um, podcast about hacking our nervous system. And this Hack is it. that place of, of going, yeah, this is not something that I have to do. But coming back to this idea of, you know, because I'm in, uncomfortable, I have choice. Right. And, and I have to be able to take time to say, this is something that I need to do, or this is something that I don't need to do. But regardless, it's an internal construct. It's happening inside of me. And because it's happening inside of me, I am responsible for its response or lack thereof. And we talked about secret service agents, which was my thing, right? Mm-hmm. You can hear gunshots and hide behind a car like the average normal person who hasn't taken any training or you can go through the training to retrain yourself to hear gunshots and stand up in front of the person you're protecting and take the bullet yourself. And hopefully you have a bulletproof vest on, right? But we can change the, the, the the discomfort, the the discomfort, right? Or the triggering event that would make us act one way. We're in charge of our own evolution. There's uh, neuroplasticity, the changing of your own brain. Anyone listening to this doesn't have to be the same person three months from now because all the cells are recreating and you can put in different energy, different thoughts, different words, different decisions, right? Be better. Be better and make the world better. Or is that too duality? (laughs) 
dualistic. Well, be present and make the world more present. Because everybody loves presents. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming towards the holidays. Come on, Brooke. Right, right. When you're, you know, we got holidays, we got birthdays. There's always a reason for presents. Where, where does happiness lie? I mean, you say the word presence. Does presence and happiness or presence and joy or presence and comfort or is there some relationship between those two? Well, in my experience, happiness is one transient, but it evolves out of acceptance of what's in front of me. I can find happiness and discomfort because I can say, hey, I'm learning something here and that brings me joy, even though it doesn't feel good. You know, we're back to That's duality. Perspective, perspective. Right? Correct. Correct. Perspective is important. Yeah. And perspective, you know, uh, comes out of experience and being able to take in other people's perspectives and to examine our own perspectives um, is, is the creation of our reality. You know, one of the stories that I like to tell is um, kind of how I came to this, this conversation about 100% uh, responsibility. And it comes out of uh, one of my teachers 20 years ago, and they were having this, this general conversation about we're all 100% responsibility for the creation of our reality and how it expresses and it floored me like i'm sure it's it's rubbing up against many of the listeners here today and not me though i'm perfect yeah and um it 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 was something that i played with and i looked at and i i pondered for many years and then when i came around to starting to write the material for this particular um course that i teach um, I went to the search engine and I typed in 100% responsibility. And what came up consistently when I was doing these searches was a story about the um, great kahunas in the Polynesian culture, these great healers, um, masters that um, help people in, in, within their society to heal, both emotionally and physically. Mm. And their process is kind of the process that I'm talking about here where um, the person that is looking for the help would come to the great kahuna and they would tell them their story and, and this master would go internal. And this speaks to that place of where we're all connected that we were talking about before. And he would go internal and look for the place in his own being where that distortion existed and he would um, resolve that within his own being. And as he resolved it within his own being, this person that came to him for the healing was healed. Mm. So again, what is inside of me is reflected outside of me. And if I, deal with it if i heal it internally then it is healed outside of me this idea of awareness acceptance approval that spiritual component at the end of the rainbow that we're talking about in terms of responsibility is that place of i don't get pinged in here anymore this conflict doesn't exist within me anymore and because it doesn't exist in me inside of me any, anymore because I'm not pinged by it, I'm not reactive to it, then we've resolved it. Whether it's resolved in the other person or not is irrelevant. It's not existent within me. Wayne Dyer stated it very succinctly. And what he said was, as, as I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. <laughs> I like that. The same comment. Right? I like that. No, I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> it's powerful. It's simple. And it's true. If I look at this differently, it's different. And, and me, that is my own perception. That is my own creation. 
And the idea here is, is the creation of this complex is my creation. I can choose to change it. And that is not um, an ethereal concept. It is the nature of existence. Everything is a reflection of what is internal to me. It's my perception. And I think that's missing. I think that's, I think that's missing because I think a lot of us think, as I have, the world is happening to me and what do I do about it and the fact that so much of it seems negative. Right. And the gurus, the teachers, the people that naturally are just better at calming down and listening are seeing more truly that nope, it is what it is and you can choose the, the way, you can choose how you look at it, the meaning you ascribe to it and that creates, that's the part of the evolution you're responsible for, that creates your experience of this thing that couldn't be changed anyway because you're not God. So I don't, let me speak to the people that don't understand the deeper parts of this, like me. I don't understand it all, but I don't understand my car at all. I just turn the key and press the gas and turn this wheel and it does what I want and I benefit from it, right? Except when it doesn't and then you wonder why it doesn't and then you have to explore it. And this is that. Exploration. And you have to have perspective. <laughs> or somebody that can... Branch it, right? People don't have to understand these truths to benefit from them and use their car, right? They just, just change, change the way you're thinking, change the way you're, be I mean, the only thing we have control of, and this is a me thing, this is not from a teacher, this is a me thing. The only thing we really have control of is the way we think and the way we act. What we do with our bodies and speaking is something we do with our body. It's our vocal cords, right? Change what you think, change how you act, including your vocal cords. Not only change your world and your kids, the place that the focus is, these kids that are being hurt because of the things your ex is doing differently than you would do. Ah, right? <laughs> Imagine focusing on that for the rest of your life if you want to make yourself miserable, right? Or you could focus on the time you do have. Again, if you're down to four hours supervised visitation, Imagine a person whose children were kidnapped, kidnapped. But the kidnapper said you could talk to him four hours a week and say anything you want to. The, what could be done in that time or the blessing, right? If you have four hours with your kids of supervised visitation, you can do a lot. You can do everything. And it's a matter of how present you are to that four hours and what it is that you want to do. You know, I think so much of this is driven. It's, it's, it's a fear driven process. And when we're reacting from fear, we're, re we're, we're, we're in freeze most of the time, or we're not in a, a place of present moment um, reality. And if we're in fear, we're not creating a situation that is conducive to growth for ourselves or for our kids. But if we move from this, this conversation that we've been having, if we move into a expression of wonderment rather than fear of what can I add here or what can I bring to this moment that makes it more tolerable, that I'm solving a problem, that I'm giving my child my attention, not because I'm afraid that I'm going to not see them for another week or I'm not going to have them next month or whatever the fear is, but I'm in this moment of relationship and I'm teaching them how to be in that moment of relationship and to be able to create what happens. Next. Right. So we may want more time. I do. Right. 
and certainly the person I'm talking about that has the very few hours a, a week would all obviously want more time as a loving parent. However, more fruit would be born by not focusing on how much time, how much more time you want, how much more time you want. Reality is reality. Cats meow and dogs bark. This is what's best right now for whatever reason that you don't understand with the time you have. With the time you have. Be present. Pour into the kids' lives. Love on them, right? Mm-hmm. He who's faithful with living, he's faithful with little is given much, right? And whether that's true or non true, uh, it's a statement that makes sense to me. Um, all you have is the little. <laughs> and if you screw it up, why would you be given more, right? So do good for the kids. Do good for you. Do good for the world. Be positive in the, in the, in the realm of evolution while you have your four hours, six hours, 30%, 50%. Do good. Be an amazing mother or father. Put that out into the world and let that butterfly effect help the human race starting with your kids. Right. Yeah. It's important stuff. So give me an example. Let's go practical. Give me an example of what it's like not to take responsibility. What's it look like to mess this up? How does somebody fail at being a, and, and let's take the person who truly, when you look at it, five, you know, three to five percent of it was them. They they were married or with somebody who's just a just psycho. You know what I mean? It wasn't them. They cheated, they whatever, whatever. What's it look like? How does somebody take responsibility, 100% responsibility for the health of their children and their parenting when, the, when it wasn't 100%, they didn't have 100% responsibility for the failure of the, the, the relationship? Well, but they did. And let's, let's go back to this isn't, um, this isn't, this 100% responsibility isn't a negotiable concept. It is 100%. So when we start to step into that, that victim place of this is a causation that's happening to me, um, that somebody else caused, then we start to react to that in a way. So the, the, the practicality piece of this that, that we're discussing here, Charlie, is if I'm in reaction to that, I am going to show up to the people that are looking at, at this, the people that are making um, decisions about this as a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. And because I'm a part of the problem, they can't see what's happening in the background with the other person. It muddies the water. And my, my contention in this is, is that all of these things have an organic solution. And if I am in the present moment, if I'm being a good parent, if I'm taking care of the things that I need to take care of, that is going to be seen. And if I'm in an argument and I am in contention that I am caused, saying that this other person is the problem and it's all them and it's all them, that's going to say something different about me, that I'm not solving the problem, mm-hmm. and it muddies it. So this idea back to 100% responsibility, if I'm just taking care of business, that is going to be seen as a positive moment. And it, these positive moments add on each other and add on each other. And the resolution in these things, by their very nature, isn't now. It's going to take time. And we have to be willing to watch it unfold and to stay in that place of I'm just taking care of business. I'm being a good parent. I'm paying my bills. I'm getting the kids to school. I'm nurturing them. I'm taking care of their needs. And I'm not in this fight for this fight. I'm in this to just do what is the right thing to do. And that is where the resolution happens. Because then I can be seen as what I am and the other parent can be seen for what they are. Mm -hmm. And that isn't something that I am doing to them. It's something that I am doing for me and for my children. So that's, that's where this perspective is really a practical moment. It's good. You get this, don't you? <laughs> On a good day. <laughs> On a good day. You're having a good day? Is it always yeah. a good day when we record, or are you going to tell me if it's a bad day? No, every day is a good day. <laughs>
It's all good. It is all good. What's happening is good, right? right. And that perspective is healthy and needs to be taught to kids. Yeah. Yeah. What did you learn from that? That was oh. uncomfortable. What did you learn from that? Yeah. How would you do that differently? What would you change from this? That's present moment conversation, and that is problem solving. With and kids? Or, are we talking about with kids or with, with everyone? Everybody. Everybody. That's probably, I, I was forced to take a four-week course I didn't want to take, court appointed, part of the divorce, all of that, right? But I show up everywhere ready to learn why am I here for something good, right? And one of the interesting things I've learned was very similar to what you just said, which is when talking to children, they come home and they say, Johnny beat me up and took my lunch money, whatever, right? Whose problem is it? It's the child's problem, right? It's, they are having a problem. It's not me, right? Okay. You know, buddy, what do you, what do you, what did you learn from that? What do you think, what do you want to do about that? What are your options? And they're either going to come up with options. You're, you, it's still just this conversation we're having. It's still just words, right? Mm -hmm. And they're either going to have ideas or they're not going to have ideas. And if they don't have ideas, probably my favorite thing I learned in the class was ask to be invited in. Just say, are you open to suggestions? Right. Because kids, not just kids, humans. These are little humans, right? Humans don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> so if we can talk about parenting for a moment, telling kids what to do. Remember the remember you mentioned what it was like when you grew up, the you know, children should be seen and not heard, probably, right? Well, it was a common one. Oh my gosh. Like shut up and do what you're told, hit you with a stick if you don't, like just the very like here's what you should be, whatevs, right? Um children, humans don't like to be told what to do. So this teacher teaching the class was saying, ask to be invited in. Just say, are you open to suggestions of how to handle this problem that you're having? Not, I'm going to run down to the school and curse out the principal, right? Um, very good. Kids need to be taught how to think. And if you do the thinking for them, where are they going to learn how to think by the time it's time to enter the world? Well, they look to somebody else to make the choices and it takes them out of 100% responsibility for their own movement in their lives and it takes them away from being present for solving the problem and it puts them in being a victim. And that's the, the conundrum of teaching critical thinking and taking responsibility for what happened because part of the conversation with Billy getting punched in the nose and having his lunch money taken away, there was something that led up to that and understanding what led up to that yep. is an important conversation and seeing what was happening on the other side of that is also a, a, an important conversation in this perspective of what's, happening to the bully that's doing this and um, how do we not go down that road again? How do we not step into that manhole and fall in? So yeah, this is the parenting concept and bringing it back around to when we're in a hundred percent responsibility, we're in problem solving. We're not a victim. So let me wrap it up this way. You, we as high conflict co-parents, we as people that are in high conflict with somebody that we've had a child with, right? Even if it's adopted, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, they're adopted, I should say. Um, the practice, the getting good at this is part of becoming a good mom or dad because though it's not a divorce or the children in your life are not co-parenting yet, they are experiencing conflict. They're experiencing relationships with other human beings. It may look more like stealing their lunch money or beating them up or taking right. their whatever, cutting them in line. We need to be able to teach them. This isn't about changing the other person. It's about your, your actions, how you think about it, and what you do now. And it's, and it's not mom and dad are going to come into the rescue. It's this was given to you on purpose to practice and get good at owning it 100%. And what are your thoughts on what you can do 
and are you open to some suggestions? I think that that's a really good synopsis. Good. All right, folks. I don't know what we're pushing here. 45 minutes, an hour. Who knows, Brooke? We just go on and on and on. But this is another episode of the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast. We'll be back next week. Uh, try to release on Fridays every morning. Hope this is helping. Get in touch. Uh, you'll hear a commercial here in a moment, how to get in touch with Brooke if you'd like more help or to read his, book, his books or go to his, pod, his uh, website. Uh, Brooke Olson and Charlie Jewett signing out. We'll be back next week to help you some more. Talk to you Thanks, soon. It. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Brooke, people don't have to wait until Friday mornings to, to get more content. If this is something that's helpful for them, right? This isn't the first time you've broadcast anything or recorded anything or put anything out there in the world. What are the other ways people can be, uh, get the help more aggressively or speed up their recovery process? What materials are available for people right now? Well, I've written a book called The Black Hole of High Conflict, and it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Great. And everything that we're talking about is really um, compressed and, and put into there. So this is a really good starter place to get in and, and get your mind working and to see um, what uh, these concepts are about and, and how to start to apply them. The other place that I think that um, is valuable is to go to our website and um, look at some of the blog articles that I've written. Those are available there as well. If they go into some of these other um, arenas and that's at www.highconflict.net so the book the website um, are also really good places to get the material and also um, we have classes we have high conflict diversion program classes that um, you can get into and get some one-on-one -on -one help with this as well and you know me I'm aggressive I whatever I want to become good at or learn I find someone who's good at it and pay them and hire them and shorten my learning curve. What if somebody just wants your help? Somebody says, Brooke has this information. He's good at something I'm not good at yet. And I want to work with him. Do you have any type of coaching or consultations or anything like that? Absolutely. I do. I do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching for um, custody um, cases. I help people get ready for family court services. Um, if you've got that in your community, um, I work with attorneys and um, clients to help them with um, managing and strategically setting them up to um, have more successful cases as well. And how do they reach out? You want them to just go to the website or email or phone or what's the best way for them to reach out, raise their hand and say, I, I need some help. Um, they can email me. Uh, my direct email is, is brook at highconflict.net. That's B-R-O-O-K at highconflict, H-I-G-H, conflict.net. Perfect. That's everything everybody would need to get some help, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Charlie.